Now last year, Dell caused a stir with their affordable G-Series gaming laptops. New for 2019, they slimmed down the G5 and the G7 and upgraded them with the RTX graphics. This is Stephen from Owner Disown, and today I'm going to be reviewing the G5 5590 with an RTX 2060. Is it worth your hard-earned cash? New for this year, Dell slimmed down the G5 to 23mm from last year's 25mm and actually made it 25mm less wide by narrowing the bezels. Despite this, it is about 2 ounces heavier but certainly makes for a more modern looking laptop. I do like the hinge forward design which makes it easier to carry with the lid open. It is also available as a special white edition which costs an extra $20. Although the G5 starts at $1,000, it only gets you an i5 and a 1050 Ti with one stick of eight gigs of RAM. Now you can buy a last gen G3 for, for less than this and it has a GTX 1060 in it. So I would probably look to the new RTX line. My special edition unit cost me $1,800 after tax. And that got me an i7 8758 CPU, an RTX 2060 and one stick of 16 gigabytes of RAM. That's yeah, that's single channel, and I will show you how that impacts performance versus dual channel. It has a 512 gigabyte SSD, a 90 watt hour battery, and a 60 hertz panel, which is pretty frustrating for the price. You do need to splash out another $100 to get that 144 hertz one, and an extra $30 if you want four zone RGB keyboard lighting. So that adds up to be quite a bit, especially if you want to get a dual ch uh, channel RAM, which will set you back another $100. The G5 fits nicely into a business setting as it doesn't scream gamer, and I particularly like how the Dell logo reflects the light. The white coating does show smudges, and it's not the easiest to keep clean. Compared to the aluminum lid on the G7, it definitely has more flex, but that is why the G7 costs $100 more. The AUO IPS panel only has a brightness of 246 nits, and although it does cope with fair reflections pretty well. Unfortunately, it is not very color accurate, so I wouldn't really recommend it for serious content creation. Plus, it didn't do very well in my ghosting test. One saving grace was that it showed little to no backlight bleed, but still, I suspect a 144Hz panel will be a better option for most people. To get inside, you remove several Phillips screws from a fairly flimsy plastic cover. I have the 90 watt hour battery, but if you opt for the mechanical drive, uh, this slot here is where that would be, and uh, then for you'd get the smaller 60 watt hour battery. I was able to get 8 hours of runtime at 25% brightness, which was awesome. Now here are the RAM slots, of which only one is populated. You can actually have 64 gigabytes once the, uh, the 32 gigabyte sticks are widely available. Here you have the GPU and the CPU. There are three screws for the GPU and four for the CPU. There are two shared heat pipes and two separate ones going to four heat sinks. But there are very small air intakes in the base which certainly don't help with the airflow. On this special edition, you do have a nice transparent window showing the blue heat pipes. Now there is only one M.2 PCI Express slot unfortunately, but you do get good Wi-Fi with a 9560 Wi-Fi card. Still, it plays fine and I did enjoy using it. It's just that it does get rather hot. My CPU was running close to 100 degrees Celsius much of the time. Consequently, the chassis also gets quite warm, especially since no cool air is brought in via the keyboard. The keys themselves also get quite warm. Even the AWSD keys are in the mid to high 30s. You do see warm air being pushed out of the four heat sinks, but underneath it has a nice hot spot at about 54 degrees. And I'm thinking if this was the uh, aluminium base of the G7, then that would be hotter still. Even when placed on a notebook cooler, it ran hot, so it's a prime candidate for some throttle stop treatment, I think. I was hoping for some fan control, but all I had to play with was their four thermal settings. Now, in my testing, I use ultra performance as it increases the fan speed, but I did try uh, a handbrake run using their optimized setting, and it still ran in the high 90s. Dell did port the Alienware Control Center to the G-Series, and unfortunately there is no control of the fans there either. You can check clock speeds and temperatures, you can configure your audio, and if you have the RGB keyboard, you can also configure the, the RGB lighting. And it's not as if the fans are whisper quiet either, you know, 51 decibels is still up there, 
so perhaps they just don't move that much air. Now the webcam is placed up top. It's got a 720p webcam, this is what it looks and sounds like. On the right hand side there is a 2-in-1 SD micro media reader, a USB 3.1 type A and an air vent. At the back it's good to see a number of ports including the power, HDMI 2.0, USB 3.1, mini display port, gigabit ethernet port and a wedge lock slot. This layout definitely helps with cable management. On the left we have the second side air vent, a USB-C with 4 lane Thunderbolt and DisplayPort support, a USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A with PowerShare and the combo headphone mic jack. Now its speakers blend in very well at the front. And I found them to be reasonably loud and quite full. They do, they do not sound tinny at all and I think, you know what, I think they'll do a very good job with these speakers. Unfortunately, if you want to use it for real-time audio, it failed my latency mon test. Now, there are a couple of drivers seemingly pointing to the cause of this latency. The keyboard deck is actually made of aluminium and feels rather nice, and the Windows Position trackpad is quite large and has a good texture to it. It uses integrated mouse buttons that were easy to press and were responsive. The keyboard on the non-RGB version is lit blue, but if you spend an extra $30, you do get that 4-zone RGB. I like how you get one button press for adjusting the volume and the two level key brightness on the keyboard. You also get a separate number pad and the power button, which is, you know, is quite bright and does not double as a fingerprint reader on my unit. One thing to note is that even though the power, power pull from the wall was you know, around about 160 watts, the 180 watt power supply isn't enough to supply the laptop without it draining the battery. In fact, whilst I was swapping in dual channel RAM, I did disconnect the battery and I just used the power brick to power the laptop and the CPU would throttle down to about 10 watts and the frame rates would drop a lot. Now to test how well it multitasks, I ran Handbrake for 30 minutes and ran repeated runs of CineBench whilst the Heaven benchmark was running in the background. Single runs of CineBench scores around about 1150 points on the i7-8758 and after my test we see about 683 points and you know this is middle of the pack performance to be honest the MSI GP63 scored about 900 and the ASUS Strix Hero 2 about 1000 so it does demonstrate that it does throttle a little bit uh, more perhaps more than the others. Now using the V-Ray benchmark to test uh, ray tracing performance the RTX 2060 is only slightly behind the 2070 Max-Q so that is good to know. Now compared to the full powered 2070 it does fall a bit behind but it easily beats the GTX 1080. In my CPU tests I use throttle stop to maintain a higher boost clock and as you can see uh, you know here in Adobe Premiere Pro using a software render we shave off a good minute and its performance is similar to the Razer 15 but trails the new Aero 15. However handbrake is quite a taxing test for the CPU but my G5 here performs really well handily beating both the Aero 15 and Razer 15. Now using my tweak it shaved off nearly three minutes. In my gaming tests I run the stock single channel and then overclocked the GPU whilst undervolting the CPU by 135 millivolts and downclocking it to 3600 megahertz. I do a third test using stock clocks but dual channel RAM so you can see what performance you can gain by adding another stick. In Rainbow Six Siege we have single channel RAM on the left and with it overclocked on the right. Now these are both ran at ultra settings and you can see a slight increase in frame rate plus also a reduction in temperatures with my tweak. It's needed though because at stock we are approaching 100 degrees. Now on the left we have dual channel and on the right we have uh, dual channel overclocked. Now dual channel really does help it over single channel and if you overclock it we see a really nice boost with the CPU remaining below 90 degrees. So as you can see dual channel boost this game by about 18% even surpassing the high preset. With single channel the frame rate is pretty constant as we move down in quality settings. This shows that the system is being bottlenecked. Now another game that benefits from dual channel is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So on the left we have single channel using very high settings. In this scene you can see that the CPU throttles down to about 2900 MHz and to about 22 watts. Now overclocking it on the right, it holds a steady clock rate and power to the CPU. Now with dual channel on the right, we see that even though the GPU clock rate is higher, higher than on the single channel, the frame rate is much higher with that extra stick of RAM. 
the CPU is now able to work to its full potential, but as a result, it gets very hot. So you will need to apply my tweak to bring those temperatures down. Switching to dual channel provides a 53% performance gain. Without it, you'll have to drop to low settings to get the same performance. I just do not understand why Dell does not put two sticks of eight gigabyte of RAM in here. I really don't. Battlefield 5 auto settings, DX11, single channel on the left and dual channel on the right. Now both do run very hot hitting 100 degrees Celsius, but we do see a decent performance boost of about 19%. Even overclocking the single channel increases the frame rate by 13%. Reducing quality settings doesn't really help either because it is being bottlenecked by that single stick of RAM. How does the RTX 2060 handle ray tracing in Battlefield 5? Well, using ultra settings, single channel on the left, dual channel on the right, we see a slight increase in frame rate at the expense of uh, increased temperatures, but you still see dips to about 20 FPS. This means, you know, to enjoy ray tracing in Battlefield 5, you must drop quality settings, and I recommend, you know, either medium or perhaps high at most to have minimum frame rates of about 30 FPS. Far Cry 5 is another game that loves dual channel. We see about a 15% performance boost here. Either way though, it runs hot at about 100 degrees Celsius. Now applying my overclock settings really does help bring those temperatures down. We don't see much of a performance boost unfortunately, but, however, but I'd rather take better thermals any day. Now not all games seem to gain much improvements, you know, switching to dual channel though. PUBG is one such game, but again, it runs hot. So I do recommend applying my overclock settings. Bring those temps down and get a slightly higher frame rate. Doing so, we get a similar frame rate as the high setting. Metro Exodus also uses ray tracing, but the inbuilt benchmark is not very representative of actual performance. Had ultra settings and ray tracing at high, single channel was playable at around about 50 FPS, but much depends on what scene you're looking at. When I over overclock it, I'm getting around about 80. Dual channel uh, RAM steps this up to about 90 FPS, so it's definitely playable, and I did see some benefit using DLSS. Fortnite actually didn't see much benefit with dual channel, um, unfortunately, but again, we see high CPU temperatures. But on the whole, the GPU is pretty cool. Overclocking did see a nice performance boost, and again, it brings down the CPU temperatures nicely. Lower in quality settings, you have only yielded the benefit when it actually reached the low setting. Now here is a summation of the clock speeds, the temperatures and the power usage, both at stock and using my tweak in green. The top two charts are for the CPU and we see we get a six degree reduction in average CPU temperature using my tweak. And since it power throttles at stock anyway, the average CPU clock rate is about the same. Looking at the max temperatures, the tweak gives us a 10 degree and 21 watt reduction. The GPU temperatures stay pretty constant and are very good. Usually the RTX line throttles at around about 87 degrees, so we are well within that. My tweak did allow for an increase in both average and boost clocks too. I did test other games as well, so make sure to click on the results link in the description below to get a full breakdown of my tests. How would I sum up the new G5? Well, I like what they did on the styling. I like those thinner bezels, it makes it less wide, and I do like the look of the white edition, although I do question its durability over time. It fits nicely into any setting, which opens it up to a larger audience. And I also did like the battery life and the speakers, they were very good. Cooling performance, perhaps not so much. Although the GPU was fine, the CPU ran very hot, and it was disappointing that a cooling pad didn't really help all that much. The 60Hz panel is a disappointment at the $1800 price point. It's something you know we would expect on a $1000 machine, really. Also, I think the RGB keyboard should be standard. Not charging $30 for it, that seems like penny pinching to me. As is the single channel RAM, you know, really, there is no excuse not to put two DIMMs in here, and Dell should know better. If the temperatures were better and the price was some $300 cheaper, I would give it a recommended buy, but as it is, I think there are better value options out there. I'd like to thank you for watching, like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.